All right, welcome back to David and History for the Ages. I have a great topic for you here, Napoleon. There's another movie coming out on Napoleon. And I know a lot of people don't have time to sit through a whole huge set of lectures, but want to know a little bit about him, uh, maybe before you see the movie or after you see the movie to see how accurate it was. Um, and, you know, I tell my students, he may not be the most important person in history, although he's pretty important. He does live probably the most dramatic life in history. And if you take every Hollywood writer and put him in a room together, I don't think they can create a story as crazy as Napoleon. So, you know, as you see this new movie or watch it and wonder, you know, did they embellish anything? For me, I don't think you have to embellish anything with Napoleon to make it interesting. I'm obviously recording this before the movie comes out. Um, and so the story of Napoleon is pretty dramatic. And, you know, try to imagine as I go through this story, his rise, his fall, any one individual going through this much drama in their life, right? And it's, it's pretty crazy. So let's start from the beginning. He's born 1769. He's not even born in France. This guy we associate is from, you know, this big, big, being this major figure from France was actually born on an island called Corsica, right? You can see this island just south of France on this map here. And he's born on this island to what is basically a lower middle, uh, yeah, lower noble family. I think that's the best way to describe him, kind of lower nobility. And just as he's born around the same time, that is when the island is taken over by the French. So he is basically, his whole life birth is, is associated at the same time that France essentially is taking over Corsica. Now, what does that mean for him? It means that his dad sees an opportunity. His dad says, oh, cool. Now, of course, because part of France, I could send my son to France to learn, which he does. So as a young boy, Napoleon goes to France. He studies. And a lot of people know he studies all this military stuff. Yes, he does. But he studies more than the military stuff. He reads Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers, and that really influences him. You know, the dates, specific dates don't matter too much, but remember, we're getting close when he's a young man to when the French Revolution breaks out, and he's very kind of taken by all of this and what's going on, and it does impact him in different ways. So anyways, he spent some time in France after learning his education, goes back to Corsica to his home goes back to Corsica, and all of a sudden he has this big kind of conflict with this governor there named Paoli, which leads to him and his family being uh, um, ostracized, basically kicked out of, of Corsica. Um, and his family becomes refugees. So he's a young man now, his family becomes refugees. Well, they go back to France. So he goes back to France, and then you know, we get to 1789. 1789, the French Revolution breaks out. Napoleon, of course, gets into the French military, and he starts having some pretty good victories, starts rising up in the military. We get to 1798. Obviously, I'm skipping a lot of detail here to do this in a short amount of time here. Um, but we get to 1798. He's involved in this big battle called the Battle of Pyramids, which really is successful for him and elevates him. And in 1798, 1799, this is also what we call the directory stage of this kind of fall of the French Revolution. The French Revolution is almost over. I have several lectures on the French Revolution, which obviously I'm not going to get into here, but um, you could easily find all of them in my channel, my History 111 playlist. Um, and, and when he's rising, there are people within this chaos of the French Revolution who look at Napoleon as a person who could take control of France. And some people want to kind of make him their puppet. He's only 30 years old in 1799. Um, and they think, oh, we'll just put this young, charismatic guy. The, soul, the, the, the He's popular with the people, but we'll really be pulling the strings. Doesn't take long to figure out Napoleon is no one's puppet. So by 1800, 1801, he's fully in charge of France. And, you know, he starts, he builds roads, he roads, bridges, canals. Uh, he introduces something called the civil code to France, which brings in a lot of the enlightenment ideas. You know, this question I ask my students all the time after we spend a lot more time on Napoleon is, who is Napoleon? He's a very kind of split personality guy in some ways. Is he a child of the Enlightenment who, who, who wants to promote more liberty and freedom for people? Or is he more of a typical authoritarian dictator? Or is he some mishmash of them? Or does he start as one and become more like the other? Uh, because, yes, he institutes the civil code. But by 1804, he also takes the title of emperor which is absolutely mind-blowing considering you had this whole French Revolution, which was about getting rid of absolutism, and he manages in 1804 to take the title of emperor, right? 
Um, so he's rising. He's being he's basically loved by many people in France. Um, as I said, he's building things up. He's providing some sort of um, basic kind of health and sanitation to people. Um, and and people really like him. And he's having more military successes. I have this other battle there called the Battle of Austerlitz which again, there's videos that go into a lot more detail on this, but he's outnumbered, outmaneuvers his opponents over in Austria. And, you know, he has another great successful military. And what you start to see is he's doing great at home, but foreign policy, he's just expanding. He takes over, obviously, France. He moves down into Italy. He takes over what would be the kind of, kind of, um, there is no Germany at the time, but a lot of these kind of German states area. He takes over Austria. Um, he's, you know, controlling Spain and he's doing this very quickly. Another little quick side note, he needs some money. So he sells a little piece of land called the Louisiana Purchase to the United States. This is actually kind of one of the another little twist in history because that brings in a lot of money uh, to Napoleon, but also helps dramatically expand the United States. So he's doing really well, he's moving, he's conquering, he's having great success. So what happens to him? All right, so now we get to the story of what happens. How does this all collapse for him? So he's very successful, except, of course, he runs into the issue of the British Navy. This is one big issue. So there's a man named Lord Nelson. A lot of people know who he is. He's an admiral of the British fleet. And he's got this ship, the HMS Victory. He's actually going to be killed in a very famous battle fighting Napoleon's navy. Um, but what this means is Napoleon is never able to invade England. And Napoleon instead turns his attention to Russia. And he moves his forces into Russia. And at first, he has pretty good success, right? He moves, he's got his grand army, hundreds of thousands of men. They make their way into Russia. Um, and as they make their way into Russia, you know, they're, they're, you know, the Russians see this and the Russians aren't even fighting initially. They do something called scorched earth, which is Napoleon's men move in and instead of fighting, they retreat and they burn. They retreat and they burn uh, the surrounding areas. And so he's making progress, but eventually we get to 1812, Napoleon's in Moscow and it is cold. That's when the winter hits and it gets cold there. Um, and when it gets cold there in Moscow, what ends up happening is his troops aren't prepared for this. They, you know, the scorched earth means they don't even have many areas to, to work with. You know, Napoleon, when he was marching, it's amazing. His men were going like 30 miles a day in some cases, 20 to 30 miles a day by foot. You know, try to again imagine that you go on a hike and you go on a few mile hike and you're like tired at the end and no one's trying to kill you at the time, right? These guys are marching, they're fighting, they're forging for food. Um, so they're not surprised, they're exhausted. And then the cold winter and then there's the Russians attack, then Napoleon's army has to do the great retreat. So they get back, you know, he loses a lot of men. And then by 1813, the other countries in Europe sense that weakness, Austria, Prussia, um, England, obviously, Russia, and they all gather together and they manage to defeat Napoleon and capture him. Now, you don't want to kill Napoleon. And one reason you don't want to kill Napoleon is you don't want to make him a martyr. Uh, one of the things is Napoleon went into these places like Austria and so forth, a lot of people liked him because, yeah, he marched in with his army, but he also marched in with that civil code. And a lot of people kind of appreciated that. Not everyone. There's a crazy little story about Beethoven, who first really liked Napoleon and then saw him more of as a dictator. And he blotted out his name in one of his uh, works that he dedicated to Napoleon. Uh, so, again, just this very dynamic person. So, anyways, they capture him. What do they do with him? They put him on this little island called Elba. Um, in this little island of Elba, if you can see where Corsica is on this map, and Italy, it's right in between. And they actually let him be emperor of Elba. Now, for most people, being emperor on a Mediterranean island is a great thing, right? You know, wonderful. But for a man who's just, you know, in a blink of an eye earlier, controlled everything from Spain to parts of Russia, you know, being emperor of Elba gets a little boring for him. So he escapes from Elba. Um, I don't know if escape is the right word. He kind of gets out of Elba. He goes back to France, retakes control of France from this monarch, uh, Louis XVIII, that was basically put in. They restored the old uh, Bourbon line. Again, it's all stuff that goes back to the French Revolution. 
So anyways, he gets back to France, you know, very quickly, the people in France prefer him than to Louis, um, you know, Louis tries to send men to stop him, and those men join Napoleon, and they move into France, and the rest of Europe is, oh, no, not this again, and, and, and so uh, he's gathering, he's organizing, and then there's another big battle, the Battle of Waterloo, um, and this Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon simply didn't have enough time to reestablish that amazing strength he had before. A man named Duke Wellington is able to defeat Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, and he's captured again after that battle. Now, this time, what do they do with him? They sent him to a place called St. Helena. It's not even on this map, but map, but it's in a place, it's a tiny little form of volcanic island. I, I kind, of, kind of call it an ashtray, basically, down in the South Atlantic. And this time, when they put him in St. Helena, they don't make him emperor. They make him a prisoner. They put him there. They surround him. The British have ships that surround him, soldiers that surround him all the time on this island that no one escapes from. Um, but it shows the fear that he brought in them. And there in St. Helena is where Napoleon eventually dies a few, like five, six years after that, I believe. Um, and so... You know, it's just a crazy story that this this little kid who started on Corsica, you know, whose family became refugees, took control of all of France, goes all to all this massive conquest of land, ends up, you know, being defeated, escaping, coming back and ends his life on this little island. You know, any one of those things would be a pretty dramatic life. But for Napoleon, it was all of those things. Uh, so anyways, that's as fast as I could do a little bit on Napoleon so you kind of learn a bit about him. Uh, if you watch the movie, you know a little bit of history. It's a crazy story. Um, and I'll leave some links in the comments or in the description. You can learn more about him if you want. Hope you enjoy that. Please make sure you share, like, subscribe, leave comments. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a great day.